racial divisions among us seem to be deepening, fueled at least in part by political opportunists who prey upon fear and emotion. Our guest today is Juliet Hooker, a leading thinker on democracy and race and author of a new book, Black Grief, White Grievance. Her book examines racial politics and argues that both white and black communities must learn to accept loss for different reasons and to different ends. Welcome to Lean to the Left, home of no holds barred commentary, plus interviews with fascinating people, some of them top experts, others simply with interesting stories to tell. You'll never know who will show up at Lean to the Left. Now here's your host, Bob Gaddy. Professor Hooker is the Royce Family Professor of Teaching Excellence in Political Science at Brown University, where she teaches courses on racial justice, Black political thought, Latin American political thought, democracy theory, and contemporary political theory. Before coming to Brown, she was a faculty member at the University of Texas in Austin. She also is the author of Race and the Politics of Solidarity, Theorizing Race in the Americas, and editor of Black and Indigenous Resistance in the Americas, from Multiculturalism to Racist Backlash. Professor Hooker, thanks so much for joining us on our podcast today. Thank you for having me. Can you first talk to us a little bit about your book, its premise, and what prompted you to write it? Of course. One of the main arguments of the book is that political loss has been unequally distributed in the history of the United States. That because of white supremacy, Black people in general have had to shoulder a disproportionate number of losses, and that whites as a group have been able to avoid loss more because of their position as the dominant group politically, economically, socially. Now, this uneven distribution of loss has consequences for democracy because it means that some citizens are making more sacrifices on behalf of the stability of the country than others. And in democracy, everyone is supposed to lose right? That's the definition of democracy. There's change, there's rotation, no one wins all the time. And so that's one of the overall arguments. And I came to to start thinking about these questions, actually. I started writing a piece that became part of a chapter in in the book on Black protest, the second chapter in uh, 2016, after the Ferguson uprising, in after the death of Michael Brown, and then the clashes between protesters and the police and and watching all of that unfold and the way that some people were very critical of the protesters, right? Very critical of their anger. And so that led me to start thinking about what are expectations of how Black citizens can mobilize to ask for redress for things like police violence. And of course, so I started writing this in 2016 and then the 2016 presidential campaign got Donald Trump, of course, as the as a major candidate and his rhetoric that was profoundly anti-immigrant, sexist, racist in, in many ways. And so it, I started thinking about how what I came to call Black grief and white grievance were these two forces that were really driving and mobilizing people in U.S. politics today and that we needed a a way, a framework for thinking about them simultaneously rather than separately. Okay, so let's see. You say that in the United States, the fundamental civic capacity of being able to lose is not distributed equally among the races. I know you touched on that just a bit in your response to that first question. But can you expand on that just a little bit? Absolutely. So first, one of the things that I think is a a key claim in the book is that that we, we tend to think about democracy as being about empowerment, right? You go out there, you participate, you vote, you, you, you get your, your preferred policy 
enacted. And, and so you, you're empowered as a citizen. But democracy is also about losing, right? If somebody wins, that means that somebody else lost. Yeah. And so it's counterintuitive to think about it this way, but being able to lose if you fought the good fought and the rules are fair and yet you lost is as central to democracy as winning is. And, and so one of the things that I, I argue in the book, looking at these various moments in U.S. history that have been very important in terms of racial progress and, and, and change is that that every time there has been some movement towards progress, towards racial equality, that there has been backlash, right? That that Black citizens have had to engage in an enormous amount of activism to try to gain equality. And, and whenever they have done that, they have been met with backlash and resistance. Okay, I understand. Now, in your book's introduction, you write that Black grief and white grievance are linked because white grievance obscures and supplants Black grief and is often mobilized in response to it. Can you explain that for me? Yes, of course. I think one really good example of this is if you think about the Black Lives Matter protests, right, against police violence. And we know that Black people are disproportionately the victims of police violence. So saying this, the claim Black Lives Matter is meant to say, okay, why are Black people being killed by the police if we take their lives to be, to be important and meaningful? And yet in response to that, you have the folks who felt like saying Black Lives Matter wasn't, was a problem and would say in response, all lives matter, right? So this response to Black Lives Matter, all lives matter, because Black Lives Matter isn't saying all lives don't matter. It's just saying, let's look at this way in which actually people aren't acting like Black Lives Matter. So for me, that's an example of how when you say something like Black Lives Matter, there's some people who feel like that's taking away something from them and that they need to respond by saying, actually, all lives matter. Yeah, I, I understand. Now, you mentioned Trump administration coming into power. I suppose we could go on for six hours on this one, but how did the Trump administration exacerbate uh, all of these problems that we're now experiencing, these problems of racial division that seem to be increasing? There's no question that that the Trump presidency has made those problems worse. Absolutely. One of the arguments that I make in in the book in Black Grief, White Grievance is that white grievance or backlash to seeming moments of racial progress is not new. So this is not the first moment that we've experienced it in the history of the United States. But it's definitely the case that we're in a very um, fierce moment, I think, of backlash. One way to think about this is to think about the Trump presidency as a reaction to the Obama presidency. Yeah, right. I was going to ask you that because it seems to me that it seemed to me that after Trump was elected, I was at a softball game. I used to play uh, softball with a bunch of guys and uh, here in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, I had just moved here and it was right after maybe the day or two after the election. And I overheard a bunch of the guys that I was playing softball with talking in the in the dugout. And one guy said to the other, now we can say whatever we want. We can do whatever we want. Meaning that Trump has given them permission to be racist, basically. And that attitude seemed to me that had been held within. They were angry that they had a black president in Obama. And now they had the opportunity to have their own guy and to react in their own way. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. I think if you look at the 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 political um, behavior, the public opinion and the polling, people who do that kind of, of research, um, it's a 
clear that they found that there's been an increase in what they call racial resentment um, during the Obama presidency, right? Feeling of being displaced, especially among white voters. And and I think that there was definitely, at least there's definitely a way in which, you know, part of the appeal of Trump, I think, was precisely what you were saying, right? That he said all these things that weren't weren't PC that violated all these norms. And it made people feel empowered to say, oh, he did that. That means I can do that. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about loss. Trump hates to lose. And the other night at the Republican debate, they were all complaining that all they've been doing is losing. (laughs) And January 6th was a reaction to Trump's 2020 loss in a huge way. Is that an example of white grievance? What happened on January 6th? I think it is. Of course, there are a number of different things that were going on that fueled January 6th. But I think we one way to think about, or one of the factors is definitely this mobilization of the sense that that certain people aren't supposed to lose, right? Yeah. In, in the US, that they are the true Americans, right? If you remember that from uh, Sarah Palin, the real Americans, right? Yeah. And I think this gets mobilized a lot where people are, are are saying, if we lose, it must be because something, there was some cheating because we're not supposed to lose. And if you look at the rhetoric around where people were upset the most about in terms of the states that they lost or the cities, there was always this suspicion about the big cities, right, where you have a lot of voters of color and whether there was cheating there in a way that you didn't have people going, oh, there's this rural small town in Ohio that voted for Biden. That must be an anomaly. So I think there's really um, a sense that certain certain voters, certain certain kinds of victories aren't as legitimate. And also then that fuels the sense that that we are not supposed to lose. And if we lost, it must be because there was some kind of fraud. And I think January 6th was definitely an expression of that and an example of all these people who were mobilized by this rhetoric of the big lie of the, that the 2020 election was stolen. Yeah. We're going to come back to that in a minute, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about Trump's attacks on immigrants, um, Mm -hmm. how he constantly denigrates them, bringing in drugs, terrorists, all this stuff. And the Republicans, the Republican candidates that are trying to win the nomination despite Trump. At the debate the other night, that's all they talked about was doubling down on, not all they talked about, but one of the things they talked about, doubling down on uh, closing the uh, southern border with all these scare tactics. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. So I think one of the ways in which, one of the things that I argue is that one of the features of white grievance is this, is this sense of, are these apocalyptic right scenarios these visions that you're having this these enormous changes in the United States and that um, in particular I think white white Christians white men are being displaced and immigration plays a big role in that right because it it, it becomes the the sort of the threat from the outside right think about the rhetoric that people use to talk about immigration that there is a kind of invasion, right? Well, what's an invasion? It's a military attack, usually by another country. So when people talk about immigrants in this way, it's this, I think it it points to the sense that they are coming in, they're taking over, they're displacing rightful Americans, and it takes away attention actually from the serious problems that have nothing to do with the presence of immigrants, but that might be maybe that, you know, you have growing economic inequality in the country, right? That affects people in really negative ways or whatever the case may be. And and I think a lot of those fears, those resentments, those, those challenges are then displaced on immigrants as if they're the cause of these dislocations that people are experiencing. 
particularly, I think, in terms of, of, of a fear that U.S. people talk about this all the time, how U.S. demographics, the demographics of the country are changing. And and I think this is, there's a lot of, of fear that the country's moving in a direction that some people don't support. And, and immigrants become a scapegoat for some of those fears. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And it just doesn't seem to be stopping at all. Matter of fact, it seems to be getting worse, I think. Now, you write that Black citizens are expected to protest only in the most civil, non-destructive ways in order for their losses to be legible. Refusals to contain Black rage are said to be counterproductive because they alienate potential white allies. Are you saying that violent, disruptive protests are justified? What I am saying is that we have this idea, this idealized notion of what the right way to protest is. Yeah. And we tend to assume that, particularly in the case of Black people, there's these historical fears dating back to slavery that you're going to have these kind of a Black violence, right? Of this idea that you're going to have these violent Black uprisings. So I think whenever there is mobilization, for racial equality that comes into play. One of, the, one of the moments that I write about in the book is this comment after January 6th by, by Ron Johnson, the senator from Wisconsin, where he says, he's being asked, right, were you afraid when there's the attack on the Capitol? And he says, I wasn't afraid because I knew that these were good people and they were patriots. I would have been afraid if it had been Black or Antifa protesters. Mm -hmm. And that for me really encapsulates this way that it doesn't matter in a way if you are violent and you attack the, the Capitol, the seat of representative democracy in the United States, and you can still be seen as a, a patriot and a law-abiding person. Yeah. But you just do any kind of protest for equality, for social change, you're a threat. That's what that quote encapsulates to me. And I think that's part of what I'm trying to say, that that script that we have about how people need to protest actually plays out very differently for different groups. So think about my other example I'd like to, to talk about with regards to this is the, um, the athlete protests, which are the most peaceful thing you can imagine, right? When they knelt on a national anthem, no rioting, no looting, nothing destructive. And yet people were just as upset about those yeah. as marching on the streets. Yeah. Incredible. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about the January 6th event. Many of those protesters have received lengthy prison sentences for their actions. But you write that armed white anti-mask protesters in various state capitals and white insurrectionists at the Capitol received kid glove treatment compared to the heavy handed, violent, repressive tactics unleashed on racial justice protesters. Uh, do you believe justice is being served in these January 6 cases? So I think it's a welcome development that they are being prosecuted. It took a while for that to begin to happen. Um, and, and for a moment, it seemed like they there weren't really going to face many consequences. So I do think that the one of the key elements of citizenship is this idea that you are going to abide by the results, peacefully accept the results of, of legitimate elections. And so for people to try to subvert the results of an election is as is essentially to reject one of their key their key duties, their key responsibilities as citizens. So I think it's important if we don't want to keep having these instances of people marching on the Capitol if their preferred candidate doesn't win, to to, to say we need to hold people accountable for those actions and, and call it what it was, right? And not an insurrection or a, an attempt to subvert um, a legitimate elect election rather than saying, you know, they were just tourists or they were just um, sightseeing, even though we've all right. seen the images. I think it's important for democracy to do that. Yeah. I worked at the Capitol for 
seven years for two different members of Congress back in the day. Mm -hmm. And I never saw any protests like the one that occurred on January 6th, I'll tell you that. To me, that was just an incredible thing, and it was an awful event. Now, do you think that Trump will face justice for these act for his actions regarding the election on January 6th? If so, why? And if not, why not? I don't know if he will. Yeah. And I think if he doesn't, it will be because... Unfortunately, the Republican Party, rather than choosing to stand for democracy, a large swat of it has chosen to go along with this idea that the 2020 election was stolen. And so I think a lot of their voters agree with that because they're receiving this information. They're believing these these claims that it wasn't that it wasn't really an, that the election was stolen and that therefore it was a righteous act to to try to to subvert the transfer of power. So I think the I think it's a really it's a really scary moment for US democracy right now because you have so many people who don't trust in yeah. the process. I, I think so too. And I I worry that I for one hope the guy gets convicted and thrown in jail. But if that happens, I shudder to think what'll happen in this country with his supporters. I just read a book that talks about a second civil war. Mm. Do you think that kind of thing is possible? So I would hope that it doesn't come to that, but I think the the real, the, the very dangerous moment that we are facing right now is that there are, um, a significant number of people in the country who are willing to dispense with democracy if they don't prevail in elections. If they're not able to win elections, they're willing to dispense with democracy. One of the things that I found extremely, that is extremely worrying, I don't know if you saw this, but after the Ohio voters voted in favor of the right to abortion is people who came out and said that maybe democracy isn't the way to make these decisions. Mm. And I think that attitude is the really worrying thing that could lead to the second civil war outcome that you were mentioning. Because if you, right, if you don't believe in democracy, that means you believe in tyranny. That means you're willing to force other people to follow your political beliefs. And, and that's a real, um, that's a serious threat. How do you feel about what Trump has been saying these most recent days about going after his opponents if he wins, if he wins a, a second term, using the Justice Department to hunt down and prosecute those who opposed him? That's a tried and true tactic of authoritarian governments, right? You use the judicial system to 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 root out your opponents and to 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 get them out of the way. And it politicizes the the justice system and, and subverts the rule of law. And so I think that this is precisely the kind of rhetoric that is deeply, deeply problematic and 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 that and that encourages people to be lawless and to become violent because it it's this worldview that says, in some ways, it's it's a kind of messianic thing, right? I'm your savior, and mine is the only way. And if I don't prevail, then we have to we have to engage in these very extreme tactics to make yeah. sure that that our side or our views prevail, and the other side is the enemy. And we can never find common ground with them. That doesn't work in democracy because you have to be able to work with people. If you have this rhetoric where it's the other side is the enemy and and they need to be eliminated, that just leads, that's a classic um, authoritarian attitude. I'm wondering what you're seeing in your students, how they're reacting to all these things. Do you have any observations about that? Yeah, I think it's a very it's a very difficult moment for a lot of a lot of students. I think a lot of, of them feel a real disconnect between their own political positions and those of, for example, 
some of the people that they see in power and some of them. So I think there's two things. I think sometimes there's a sense that we as young people don't really have a say or our views aren't listened to or aren't attended to in the same way by elected officials. And then on the other hand, I think there's a lot of activism, right? I think, and and there's a lot in the news right now and, and has been for a while where people take on college students as these, these they're out there, they're doing these things, they're not thoughtful, they're, they're extreme. But on the other hand, I find it really hopeful that students are, you know, are, they're doing what are out there trying to to advocate for the positions that they believe in. Sometimes they might do it in the wrong way, but I think that's what we want, right? We want citizens to be engaged. We want young people to think that they have a say in what happens in the country. And so I I actually find that in terms of thinking about my students, that I what I want, what I would hope from that for them is that they're they're mobilized, they're engaged rather than they're apathetic because they think, oh, nothing we do matters because we can't actually change anything. Are your students mostly um, Black or do you have a mixture or what? I'm at Brown, so we have we definitely have a mixture. I think it's a certainly a majority white institution. I do have a mix of students in my classes, but I think the some of the, the things that I'm describing are, are things that are shared across g- those groups. Yeah. Okay. So would you say you're hopeful about the new generation coming in, people that'll be coming into positions of power in the, in the future? Yeah, I think, you know, that, yeah, they don't always get it right. I don't always agree with everything they do, but I think they they're very thoughtful. At least if I think about my students, they're they want to learn and they have and they're trying to figure out I think in a really difficult moment. I think about this younger generation, right? They just went through a pandemic. They're looking at what's going to happen with climate change, what kind of future there might be. I think these are young people who are facing a lot of challenges and and I think are trying to think about how to address some really big problems. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned police shootings a little while ago. What needs to happen in your opinion to curb this kind of behavior by the police? Ah, uh, that's a very big question. I think that the problem has proven pretty intractable so far, right? So I think I was looking at statistics that said um, that 2022 was the had the highest number of police shootings to date or something um, like that. So it's not getting better necessarily. I think one of the things that is really important is accountability. I think there was, there's this way in which these, you get these kind of panics around crime and people then then say oh, we have to have these huge police budgets and we have to have this militarized policing and i think that has shown that it hasn't really worked and i think the the lack of accountability for for police officers for the sort of ways in which i'm a fan of unions but police unions i think have been really problematic in shielding police officers from accountability so i think all of those things are things that we need to rethink how how we think about safety. And, and for example, maybe the police aren't the people who should be responding to people having mental health issues. I think that's been clearly shown that a lot of police killings have been, instead of helping, they've actually ended up making um, the situation much worse. So I think we need to be creative in thinking about how we, we address some of the, how we rethink policing, but also think about how do we reimagine, I don't know, things like the safety net or investments in, in, in people so that we don't get to the point and in communities so that we can have less policing, right? Because right now police are the people you call for all sorts of situations when people find themselves with, with facing a range of problems that aren't really about crime necessarily. 
But you're not saying defund the police, right? <laughs> I'm saying let's rethink the police. Let's rethink what the police do. Let's rethink how we think about what the police do. You remember that slogan? This is from the, the the Black Lives Matter protest, which is who do you protect? Who do you serve? How do we get people, I think, to think about what policing means differently, right? So instead of being there to, to, to impose your power over people that you're actually there to, to serve the community, can policing do that or become that? That would be a good idea. Uh, I think it would also be a good idea to spend some more money on mental health training, don't you? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Now, you write that despite recurring anxiety, that black rage at ongoing loss will fray the bonds of the body politic. It is, in fact, white refusal to accept legitimate political loss that is the most profoundly anti-democratic force in U.S. politics. Now, we've talked about that to some extent with the Trump situation, but do you want to talk about that a little bit further? Of course, yes. So I think that that part of the argument in the book is, is really saying, how do we grapple with the fact that we have a lot of fear about what happens when Black people protest, right? What happens when people are out in the streets? And we see these as kind of moments of crisis. But we have been, I think, much less attentive to the ways in which white grievance and white refusal, right, this resistance to loss has really been damaging historically to U.S. democracy. I mean, if you, you know, that those have been the moments when U.S. democracy has been at its worst, if you think about the failure after the abolition of slavery, right, Reconstruction, when Reconstruction was was abolished, and and we moved to Jim Crow and to disenfranchisement of African Americans, or in the 1960s when you had right folks who were willing to go to the mat to defend racial segregation, that these moments are end up being these moments when the refusal to accept, right, greater rights for non-whites, for Black people, end up costing everyone because you end up with a, with a much more degraded experience and, uh, and, and dem democracy suffers. So one example of this in the present, if you think about it, is that we can make voting so much easier and so much more accessible. But then you have these fears that if a wide number of people get to vote and because of the racial sorting of the two parties where you have right a lot of um, minorities who um, vote for Democrats, that you end up having these, these policies that actually make it difficult for people to vote. And that's against the basic tenets of democracy and it hurts everyone. Like what if we had a national holiday rather than having to figure out how you're gonna get to vote on a work day around your your work schedule? Like, there are all these ways in which I think we we end up with, with a worse experience of democracy because we're afraid of the ways in which having a broader number of people have be able to exercise citizenship fully, how that might affect the, the the people who have historically, whites who have historically been at the center of U.S. democracy. Of course, the Republicans have said, Trump has said, that if we make it easier for people to vote, Republicans will never win another election. And so they've been spending their time finding ways to make it harder for people to vote. Is that not true? Yes, but think about it. Like that's right. The thing is, like your problem there is then have policies that will persuade people. It's not let's make it more difficult for people yeah. to vote. How about that? Why don't you come up with some policies that people, <laughs> that people can, can support instead of being oh man, I'm telling you what. Okay, so you got anything more you want to add before? Before I ask you uh, where people can find your books. <laughs> I guess all I would say is that one of the things that, that the book is trying to, to say is that we, 
I think you said this at this point earlier that Trump hates to lose and he talks and loser is an insult, right? Yeah, to be right. Losers, everybody wants to be a winner, but that yeah. actually democracy, turns, right? Turns out he's the biggest loser of them all. <laughs> but in democracy, it turns out being a good loser is a, actually a key thing that we all need to be able to do. Okay. <laughs> all right. Let's talk a little bit about your books. You've got, what, three now. Uh, this last one, which is Black Grief, White Grievance. And I have to confess, I haven't read it all, but I've read a good bit of it. And it's excellent, people. You need to pick it up if you're at all interested in these topics. And if you care about this country, it's worth it. It's worth your time. So people can find this on Amazon, I presume, and where else? They can find it on Amazon. It's also available through the Princeton University Press website. But yes, okay. also hopefully at some bookstores near you. Yeah, you published it in October, correct? Mm -hmm. How's it doing so far? It seems to be doing well. I've been really, really pleased with the ways in which people have really responded positively to the argument. And one of the nice things about it has been that people seem to get it. Right. Yeah. The, it really resonates with some of their own sense of what's been happening in the country. So that's been very, very heartening. Excellent. OK, Julia, thank you so much for being with us on our podcast. I, I appreciate it. No end. I think it's been a good discussion. And like I said, you guys pick this book up. It's worth your time. Hey, guys, I hope you enjoyed this Lean to the Left video and that you learned something as well. Please come back on a regular basis and check out our interviews with guests on topics that I hope you find interesting, entertaining, and enlightening. And you can check out the schedule of upcoming shows, guests, and topics at podcast.leantotheleft.net. You can also subscribe to our audio version there or to our video shows here at YouTube. And follow us on social media. Facebook at the Lean to the Left podcast, Twitter at Lean to the Left One, Instagram at Bob Gaddy underscore Lean to the Left, and TikTok at, at Lean to the Left. Our goal is to be informative and entertaining as we and our guests comment on the latest developments in the news and about the social issues that concern us all. This is Bob Gaddy signing off for Lean to the Left. Thanks for sharing your time with us.